Creative Constitution podcast. My name is Deborah Tamai, and I'm joined by a very special guest, Matt Young, who is a locations casting director, uh, acting coach, and just so much more. So, hello, Matt. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Deborah. It's good to be here. Oh, I'm super pumped <laughs> to have you. Thanks. I'm, I'm pleased I could make it. Hell yeah. Yeah. So, as you mentioned, I am an acting coach, and I also do um, location casting for. Um, TV and films, uh, that sort of came about because I was living in Fiji and um, I needed to find a way to actually stay there and be legal. So I started my own company and I thought I was going to be doing public speaking training and then the film industry there sort of blew up. So I um, started doing acting lessons and placing people on shows. So I've put over there, I've put people on two Hallmark Channel shows, um, A Summer to Remember and Pearl in Paradise. Um, I've put people on a TBS show called Wrecked, which was a comedy uh, some of my actors went on Fantasy Island, which is a Blumhouse production, um, The Other Side of Heaven 2, which is a Mormon um, indie f- feature. Um, and then what else did we work on? Uh, Black AF? Black AF. Oh, well, that was the big one, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was pretty incredible, which is Kenya Barris. Um, so, I mean, I ho- hope everyone knows who Kenya Barris is. But if you don't, he's the guy that created Blackish and all the ish shows. Um, and he was out there starring in the show with uh, Rashida Jones and, um, and it was sort of a curb your enthusiasm meets Mm. modern family sort of thing. So it was a sort of comic documentary, but it had a much more um, aggressive tone than all the blackest shows or the mixedest shows. So it was really fun to work on and Kenya played himself (laughs) and it was about, yeah. So that was lots of fun. And I placed extras on that as well as four speaking roles as well. Wow. So that was fun. How did you get into that in the first place? Like, how does one go from, I guess, starting with no no connections to having the opportunity to work on those sorts of things? Well, I'm an actor by trade. Like, that's how I started everything. And so I grew up in the States. I went to New York University. Uh, We uh, Americans are not afraid. They're not afraid about putting themselves forward for things. Mm -hmm. Um, And also... As an actor, especially because I've moved countries a few times, um, so I've had to reinvent myself, you know, when I moved to Australia and then reinvent myself when I moved to Fiji. And so, I mean, if you don't ask, you don't get. That's right. Right. (laughs) So I would see articles in the newspaper in Fiji saying such and such production is coming. And I would go on IMDb Pro and I would contact the production company and just say, hey, just so you know, I'm here. I'm a SAG after actor if you need anybody. But also, um, if I can be of service in any way. Just let me know. You know, I can gladly have an informal meeting with you, blah, 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 blah. And so that's what happened. Um, That that was like the first big one was um, the Hallmark film. Mm. And I sort of, the producer just sort of was like, hey, listen, yeah, we just need sort of a bit of a heads up about how to get these shows done. Because Hallmark, um, they do their shows in three weeks. So like the movies are like an hour and a half or whatever, but it's shot in pretty much 15 days or I have heard days. that they go very fast. Yeah. So they do about two weeks of pre-pro, two weeks of shoot, three weeks of shooting, and then about two weeks of post. And then it's on air oh like a few God. months later. <laughs> so they really, um, Anthony Frankhauser, who was the uh, producer for that one, or who was hired, he, was the, he works with the cartel in Canada and they were the hired people to make these shows. Uh, he said, hey, j- can you just come and just meet with us and just give us a little bit of an idea of how things work here. Mm. So that's how it all started just because I was nice and I wasn't aggressive. I simply, you know, just emailed the production company and said, this is who I am. This is what I've done. If I can be of service in any way, just let me know. I didn't say, give me a job. I didn't say, Hey, you need to talk to me because I'm the guy that knows everything. I just sort of said, Hey, listen, I'm here. I've got some time. If I can help you out and if it works in my schedule, great. And then, of course, that led to a paid job <laughs> doing the casting, directing. And I also acted in the films as well. So, Oh, even <laughs> better. Two in one. Well, you do have to put the feelers out. Too many people are too shy to email people, I think. Yeah. And something I tell actors all the time or anybody in the film industry is it's really about stepping in uh, to the space and and telling people you belong in that space. And again, mm. this is it's, a lot of it's mental yeah. I was a dancer. And, you know, I was a Broadway dancer when I, at the start of my career. So I, and I was an athlete before that. So I've been in very, very high pressure situations. And, um, 
And so like to get hired for Broadway, for example, you walk into the room and you look like, you know, your shit don't stink. You know yeah, what I mean? You walk right. in and you're not arrogant, but you're like, of course you should hire me. Because yeah, you have to have why confidence. You? And so I tell people all the time, you know, you just need to step into the role and yes, it takes training to do that. It takes mental training to do that. It takes physical training to do that. It takes vocal training to do that. You know, to just step into the space and say, I'm here mm. and not back down. Yeah. Um, but the, and then the trick is like not to be aggressive about it. You know, the trick is to just, <laughs> you have just to be humble. Like stand in the middle of your orbit. You have to be so humble. It's yeah. so true. And I was listening to um, some actors talk on a podcast the other day and, um, and, one of my friends was one of the hosts and she said, so what'd you think? And I said, well, I said, I like both of those actors, but they seemed really up themselves. Mm. I said, they are very successful and I can appreciate that, but I would have liked a bit more humility. Yeah. I feel like there's always a fine line between like confidence and then just being sometimes overconfident. And then that bubble just seems huge. Like you've yeah. got, you've got yeah. attitude problems and all sorts of stuff that comes up. Yeah. And something that happens in Australia that's quite unique, I think, is because uh, I moved here when I was 27. Mm. Um, so I'm foreign born. Um, and so a lot of the actors I'm going against for roles or have been going against for roles my whole career are people that have been on TV since they were yeah, seven like years babies. old or they've <laughs> been pre uh, play school presenters or, you know, and so they kind of came from, I mean, you can't really say it's a privileged place, but in terms of the longevity of their career, it is a bit of a privilege. Mm. And so, you know, like I just watched um, Boy Swallows Universe on Netflix and the, the young man who's in the center of that show is excellent. Mm. And I reckon he'll be around for the rest of his career. And that's great. And I hope he never forgets that, you know, it, this was the first this show. This was the thing that <laughs> you know started I mean? it, yeah. <laughs> and you, you can be, you can enter the business at any age um, as long as you have humility. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So you moved to Fiji a while ago because you, you were – you were coaching and then you were part of a club there. So tell me a little bit about, about that and how that started. Okay. Well, my husband's had business in Fiji since 2006. And so we were foster to adoption parents. So we had these two kids who are now grown ups. <laughs> and uh, my husband was going away a lot to Fiji to do work. And so I said, well, what if we just go there mm. and then you can come back to, we were living in Sydney at the time, and then you can just come back to Sydney when you need to. Yeah. And the cost of living will be less, you know, the kids will, won't be under as much pressure as they are living in the middle of Sydney, blah, blah, blah. And so we went for six months to sort of see if it would work. And then it worked out really well. <laughs> so we stayed for a while. Where were you in Suva or? Yeah, in Suva. Yeah, nice. yeah, 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 yeah. And so our kids went to, um, they didn't go to the international school. They went to local schools. Uh, well, they went to like local private schools and then they went, they ended up going to LDS high school to the Mormon high school which is how I got involved in the, in the Mormon film. Uh, we're not members of the church, but, um, yeah. but it was an incredible, it's an incredible community. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And so then I was over there and I couldn't work for my husband's company because there just wasn't, you know, that capacity for that. So I started my own company called Matt Young Company. I love really it. Really fancy. <laughs> Very original. And through that, I started um, the acting classes. And then Suchiko Soru, who has a dance group over there called Vo, mm. um, said you need to find a name for what you're doing rather than like Sydney Actors Club, uh, Suva Actors Club, uh, something that's local so people feel they can have ownership. So Vo, for example, Vo Dance Company, Vo means new mm. in Fijian. And so I looked at a lot of different words and came up with Tukuna, T-U-K-U-N-A, Tukuna, mm. um, which means to say or to tell. So I thought that that would be a good, uh, a good name for it. And so we've never, like, it's not a business. We never formalized it into a business. It was always, I like the idea of a club. Mm. So that, because there's, there's not consistent work, you can't make your full career in Fiji yeah. as an actor. Like, you have to have other jobs. I mean, if you work for... Even the people that work for the big networks over there produce their own shows and all that sort of stuff. So I was like, well, let's just make it a club so mm. people can come in and come out as much as they want to. You know, expat kids can drop in and out if they want to. Um, local kids can drop in and out if they want to. And that actually worked out really well. So that was great advice from Sachiko. Thank you, Sachiko. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. When you started to get people to ask you to find actors... What was sort of the, the the way that you went about that? Was it always from the club or did you put out public casting notices? How did that work? 
It started by, and, and the same thing happens here in Australia, um, now that I live in the outback. Um, it started by a casting director who had been hired. Um, I think she, she, was, she was in Fiji, but I think maybe the group is from Australia. And she just sent me this and she said, hey, you're an acting coach. Who do you have? Can you mm. send them over? And so I sent a bunch of people over, and then I ended up going on that show as well as an extra, as a core cast extra. It was a did show you called... slip the headshot with the packet? I did. I, I did. Well, you know, you know, double dipping. Hey, you got to back double yourself. Dipping, you got to be a slashy. Um, yeah, and that's sort of how it started. And then because of that, I sort of, because I actually did get to go on set for the whole season, it was a uh, comedy called Wrecked. Um, and it was a 10 parter and it was a sort of lost parody. Mm. So I was one of the people that was on the plane, but not like one of the main people. <laughs> That's cool. Um, and so then I sort of went, Oh, I see. This is how it all works. Because up to that point, I had either been working in independent film or I had been on really huge budget Hollywood productions, like a beautiful mind or, mm. um, oh, wow. other things where I was just one of hundreds of extras in the background. And I didn't feel like I had any agency and that I could, you know, yeah. I knew I was an important part of the storytelling, but I never really felt like I was that big a part of the storytelling. Yeah. But then, I mean, being on that show for a season, and if you look at something like Elvis or any of the films that have been shot out here, the background actors are such an incredible part of the storytelling. And yeah. like every single one of them is a value. And so I was like, oh, I get this now. Like it's, now I finally understand. Totally. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's hard to see your value as an extra. I mean, I've been there too. And sometimes you're just like, oh, well, the camera's not even pointed my way. Like, why am I here? But then you watch the final product and you're like, okay, well, without, if I was to remove all the extras, it would look weird. Like yeah. It just wouldn't make sense. So you are part of the story. Baz Luhrmann, when I was on Elvis, he was like, you are all actors. You are all like necessary to the storytelling. And I think that's very empowering. Yeah. So to all you extras out there, just keep at it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You are so important. And, um, and well, it depends on the director, but don't be afraid to make noise. Um, I was on an independent production and our group of extras in the scene, I, I was playing a lead and my, uh, there was an act of violence that was perpetrated. And my character wasn't dealing with it. And so one of the extras was like, hey, you can't do that. Like, just sort of spoke up. And then the director was like, oh, what if you all make a bunch of noise? Oh. And so then everybody, like, you know, like this cacophony of noise came. And, you know, and the camera was on, the, on myself and the other lead actor. But, like the, like, the noise just brought us into the reality of it so oh, much. Oh, nice. You know what I mean? And, I, and if that hadn't happened, the scene wouldn't have become elevated to where I hope it will be when the film comes out next year. Well, some, year. sometimes I feel like as an extra, you're, it's, it's again a fine line between like putting yourself out too much and ruffling too many feathers and then you maybe get blacklisted or whatever because there's that whole thing of don't make up a line or don't say anything like otherwise you'll get kicked off the set and whatever. But then other times it does work out yeah, and well, you actually end up adding to the production. Yeah, and a lot of it does actually have to do with, um, with money. So mm -hmm. if you're an extra, you're being paid not to make any noise. Yeah. Um, because if you s say a distinctive line, then they have to change your billing. Yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> so that's, but, but, uh, but in general, if there's like crowd noise, like a big like, ooh, yeah. or whatever, or a big like, <gasps> you know, yeah, like that's usually allowed. So yeah. Um, yeah, and those are the things. Also, I come from a dance background and we were doing the musical Annie. Mm. Um, I was in the Australian tour of that back in 2012. And our director, when we were putting the cast of children from Brisbane into the show, had the ensemble do the big number Hooverville. And she said, do the dance break, but don't make any noise. This is while all the kids were sitting in the room. So we did the dance break with no noise, mm. very precise choreography. And then Karen said, I oh, know it was Kelly. And she said, great, do it again. And now do it like you do it in the show. And then we brought all that noise and the joy and the characterization into it. And the kids were like, Oh, now we get it. You nice. know what I mean? Like it's not just five, six, seven, eight. It's fully embodying this and just and I think joy is like a big part of what we do as actors. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I have a friend who's a composer, John Bacchino, and he writes these songs that are pretty sad or, you know, pretty melancholy. But he said, but like he said, every singer that I like singing my stuff, um, and he's had people like Liza Minnelli sing his songs, uh, he said they bring a joy to it. Mm. So even though the subject is sad, they're, they love singing and they love what they do. And so when you can see that they are 
just love those words and the pronunciation and the, you know, the breath. He's like, there's, there's a joy in it. even when Yeah, there's definitely. Oh, I love that. Mm. When, when you were getting those briefs, like let's just say you were casting for a bit part. What are some of the, the considerations that say the local productions, let's just say it's from like a, the U S or something, they're coming to Fiji. They want someone to play a bit part. What is usually the, what they're looking for? Like if an actor was to place themselves in the right position to get cast as that, if they're a local actor in Fiji, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, do you, what would you say is like the main considerations that they're looking for usually? The main considerations in TV in particular is timeliness. And so mm. you just have to like get things done. I always tell people to try to get things done in 24 hours. Oh, the self tapes. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Like if the line is like, do you want sugar with that? Or, you know, do you, or, you know, do you want fries with that or whatever? Like you don't need to take a week to yeah, prepare that. that. Is true. <laughs> so I'm like, well, get it in because what actors don't know is the casting director. So I probably already assembled a bunch of looks. Mm. Um, so say the role, Black AF is a great example. There was a role for the book signing woman and she was described as sort of a middle-aged Caucasian woman. Yeah. Right. And so I found three women that I thought were appropriate for that, that had American accents. And then I put in um, two other local actors, one who is um, of Indian descent and one who's Italke of Fijian descent. And so just do it in your natural accents. Mm. And, um, and they ended up picking the Italke girl. Oh, wow. Um, which I knew they would because she's a great actor. But the storytelling, like by just being herself and being authentic to herself, the storytelling, they went, oh, yeah, actually, that tells the story. Mm. So I guess it's, you know, it's, it's, it is about being, it's about not being too precious about getting it done quickly, being authentic, and then letting it go. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> right? when, when you're the casting director and the, the director said, I want American accents, what made you sort of go and consider other people as well? Was there flexibility in the project? Or is that something where you're like, you know what, I'm going to add these like left field plays to I just probably see what have happens. Tom McSweeney to thank for that. Mm. Um, when I've done classes with Tom in the past, he's talked about that sort of like when you get down to the last five people that he likes to have three people that he thinks are going to be Perfect. And then two sort of wild cards. Oh, cool. And the wild cards are usually people from, sometimes it's a switch of gender. Mm. Um, so for a male role, I'll often throw in um, a female um, or a non-binary person or um, like I'm a huge advocate for the LGBTQI plus community. So I'm always trying to get um, trans actors um, on shows as well, mm. which is interesting as well, because then I did a show called The Castaways, which is... Um, I just did some background, play some background actors on that, um, which is on Paramount Plus in the UK right now. And there was this trans actor I really wanted to use, but she, the, we couldn't use her for the scene we wanted her for. So mm. I said, well, what about if we put her into this? Oh, cool. And the, the, but the new situation, the storytelling would have been completely different because it was um, someone in a police, like someone who had just been arrested. Oh, and we right. were like, that's not a story we want to tell. Right. Like that's not a stereotype we want to perpetuate and that's not a story we want to tell. Yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah. But the other great, and this is, this is something else I tell actors all the time, deadlines mean nothing. So if you hear of a project and you're like, oh, it's already shooting and, you know, and I missed the dead, deadline by a week or a month or whatever, send your picture to the casting director anyway because what happens is people drop out. Yeah, and or then, schedules change. Yeah. yeah. Or we as the casting directors don't necessarily know who the principal actors are. So when I was on Wrecked, for example, this TBS show, um, for season two, one of my actors that had just joined the acting club was like, I really want to be in this. And I said, oh, well, they're about five to six weeks into production. So I'm not really sure. I said, but here, here's Desiree's email. Mm. Send her an email. Just say, hey, I'm here. He sent the email Karen Sony, who is um, in Deadpool, he's the taxi driver, cool. was, was on the show. And, uh, <laughs> and Nadim looks heaps like Karen. And they didn't have a, um, like a picture double for Karen because there was like some stunts and there was like actual picture double stuff. And they were like, oh my goodness. Like they got this email with the perfect person for a problem they hadn't been able to find a there solution to. Sometimes it falls in their just lap. Because, just because I was like, well... You know what? Yeah, the deadline's passed, but 
send it anyway. Because if they don't use you for this, maybe they'll use you for something else, you know? And then yeah. they were like, great. And then this kid, kid, you know, this young man, you know, gets flown across the island, gets put up in a hotel, has his first professional acting job as this uh, picture double and stand in. Uh, actually did get to do the stunt. So got a little bit of stunt training as well. That's cool. Like all because of we one sent email. in an email six weeks, uh, five weeks out to the deadline. So that's wild. Yeah. I feel like there's a few of those little nuggets of kind of information that actors just don't have access to. Another one, I recently was watching a YouTube video of a casting director um, and they were explaining how sometimes let's just say the deadline is in a week. If you send it in the first 24 hours, 48 hours, you actually have a higher chance of getting the role because as the, as the responses come in and the self tapes come in, they'll go, Ooh, I really like this one. And they'll almost put them into like the slots that they like already. And then as the deadline approaches and more self tapes come in, they'll, it's harder for them to place in like or replace the slots that were already sort of taken, like figuratively. Yeah. Um, is that something that you saw as well in, in yeah. your endeavors? What actors also don't realize is that, especially for ads, the client, so, you know, let's say it's a bank, Bank of yeah. Queensland, and I, this is not a true story about Bank of Queensland, but let's say it's Bank of Queensland. The, the people that have been charge, in charge of hiring the actors for that ad, perhaps even the background actors for that ad, don't understand acting. Mm. There are people that work in the bank, like they know their job. They oh, don't right. understand okay. our job. That's why they hire casting directors, right? And that's why casting directors hire people like me to sometimes assist them. Um, and so, um, so they want, because they're under a lot of pressure from the money person in their organization, they send you the, the, the brief and then 24 hours later, they're like, so what do you have for us? Right. Like they want to see, you know, at least 10 people. <laughs> you know, preferably so that they can kind of go, okay, great. We don't have to feel right. So it under eases as the much pressure. pressure. Yeah. yeah. So, so like they're getting pressure from above. So then they're putting pressure on the casting director and the casting director is then putting pressure on the actor saying, Hey, can you send it in 24 hours, please? Um, wow. Yeah. So that's another thing that people don't realize. And that, that is the thing about that turning it in within 24 or 48 hours is that if that, I have a long list of roles that I have to fill mm. and one of them is, um, you know, girl with brown hair, shoulder length, and you send your picture in. And then another one is, um, I don't know, wheelchair user from an Iranian background, for example. Yeah. That might be a bit more of a challenge for me if I don't have those actors within my, um, yeah, within my right. mental Rolodex already. Mm. So then I can go, okay, great. Deborah, I'm going to put you in there because that just, I can cross that off the list and then I can get to the bits of the brief that, are a bit more challenging for me. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, that totally makes sense. Yeah. So I guess when you tap into the people that first come to mind, I guess, usually, I would imagine those are, let's just say a brief comes in and then you go, okay, actually, I know people that have attended my acting classes. Are those usually the first people in that, that you sort of come to mind and that gets submitted? So I guess that's the benefit in doing those classes and yes. things like that. Yes, they are. They are. And that is the huge benefit to doing cast, uh, doing acting classes with casting directors is that we are under a lot of pressure and our brains are full. Um, uh, uh, Stephanie Pringle from chicken and chips um, casting in Sydney. I did a workshop with her and she said, what do you want to get out of it? And I said, by the end of the day, I want you to know my name mm. um, and remember who I am. And she said, you're Matt Young. I brought you in for this show, this show and this show when I was working for Fountainhead casting. She's like, I know who you are. Wow. And I said, well, how do you do that? She said, it's my job. She said, I'm a casting director. She's like, we have, I'm a cancer, so I have a, like an elephant sort of memory. She, you know, she said, that's my job is to remember people. Mm. Um, but because our heads are so full of a million people, if you're in my class, then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, well, there's someone who's showing up consistently and is doing the work. And it's like, it's like you know, being, going, being an athlete, mm. you know, you're on a swimming club. And someone goes, oh, do you have someone that can swim in 20, 25 meters in under 30 seconds? And you go, well, yes, of course. There's so-and-so yeah. and so-and-so and so-and-so. And, and, so and, so. and some people can't because they haven't been training for as long, right? So That's right. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I mean, it's not the only way you get cast, but it certainly doesn't hurt. Mm. 
<laughs> well, you're an actor as well. What have you personally seen over the, you know, you've been at it for a, a while now. What have you seen has worked the best for you in order to get more opportunities? Uh, again, it's turning it in quickly. Um, I, I always turn things in in 24 hours. And I'll find, it's interesting, I'm with um, the agent I'm with now. Uh, I really, really like and have a great relationship with. I had very frank discussions at the beginning. How do you want to interact? Should I text you? Mm. Can I make a phone call? Do you want an email? If I email you, can I email you after hours? You know, like how, like what, like what's the protocol? Like, mm, let's, that's good. like, let's just talk about, I said, my preference is that I'm going to text you at the end of every audition. Is that okay? Is that what you want? <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, um, and so they will send me something. So I live out in the bush now. So I don't live in Brisbane. I live 10 and a half hour drive away. Mm. Um, and because of COVID and because just everything shifted, um, self-tapes are so much more. Yeah, um, you do them online. Yeah. And most of the casting directors now in Brisbane know that I live out in the bush. And so they know, you know, that they need to give me at least 24 hours notice that they're going to hire me for something. And um, it will be a Monday and I'll get something through and it will be for Miss Jane Casting or whatever. I'll put it through really quickly, send it out. Then all of a sudden my agent goes, oh, great. Well, then you're available for this one, which I just got from Peter Rasmus and right, casting yeah. on Tuesday. And then I get that one done. And then it's Thursday and they go, oh, great. And then Ben Parkinson needs someone. <laughs> yes, and Michelle Ray just called. Can you put something in for that as well? And I'm like, yes. So by getting things done in 24 hours, I have increased the number of auditions exponentially. Right. I guess it all, yeah, trickles in. And then... I would imagine there's almost like a casting director club where they all, they all talk to each other and they're like, oh, well, Matt just sent in a tape. That was freaking brilliant. And, you know, he could be doing this and that. It all yeah. sort of snowballs from there. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, well, and I certainly have the casting directors that I talk to because of Fiji. So like Christina Asher um, in New Zealand. And then Danny Long called me um, about Moana because she was like, oh, we want to just um, – the, Moana had like several casting directors mm. associated with it. And they said, oh, we want to just ex, um, expand the call. Do you know people in Fiji? And I said, yeah. I was like, Danny, don't worry. I can get you by the end of the day. I can get you like 10 people um, that will send something for you. Um, yeah, so, so I, I, but I was going to say, I don't know that if we all sit around and talk to each other, but I guess we kind of do. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have like meetings. There's no like necessarily. WhatsApp group. Like. Well, but there is though, because there's the Casting Guild of Australia. So, oh, yeah, true. You know, when they meet, but they're probably not talking about individuals. But I did put in a tape for something here, um, which I didn't get. Um, I coached it with Christopher Summers, who um, is an acting coach who I really like and I've taught for his studio sometimes. And, um, and I normally don't coach like normally if it's a small part, it was, um, it's a eight episode series. It was two scenes. Mm. Um, so it wasn't a significant, it wasn't like, like a, a recurring, yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was sort a smaller of, part. Yeah. It was like still, a one day guesty, yeah. like, a, a, like a, a day player. And I thought, Oh, you know what? This one's big and it's got big stars and the scene is playing opposite one of the big stars. And so I should probably go to Chris. And I did, and we worked on it, and Chris is a great coach. I got a really, really good take out of it mm. um, where we did things physically with the camera that, that I would never have thought to do if I were doing it myself. So I moved closer to the camera, moved away from the camera. There's a lot of physicality in the right, scene. Right, more movements. Yeah, yeah, I was supposed to be like lobbing tennis balls and all this sort of stuff. Like it was sort of like in the middle of a tennis match. And, um, and anyway, I sent that in, and then I didn't get that, but – my agents clearly sent, clearly were like, hey, to a couple of other casting directors because I got an offer for something else. Oh, like wow. Got, oh, so they shared the I, video. I got like an asked availability. Yeah, cool. Like pretty much the day after. Right. So you know that tape traveled. Yeah. And something similar happened. Um, yeah, again. So, you know, ACTA, the Australian Academy of Cinema and Television Arts, they had this, they were trying, they partnered with Meta when, um, when Instagram Reels first came out and they mm. were trying to get content and they yeah. were trying to get people to switch over from TikTok. So they had this act a comedy thing where like each month you could submit um, like a, a less than 30 second comic thing around a theme. I was a finalist a couple of times and I won sort of like a, I didn't win the whole thing, but I won like a second prize or whatever. Nice. And that was on a Friday. And then on the Monday I got a, 
we got a call from McGregor casting going, is Matt available for Young Rock on this day? Wow. And I'm sure it's because of the thing that I had posted on Acta. I guess you just never know where the opportunities are going to come from. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I didn't get the Young Rock job either, so. Oh. I never get any jobs. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. <laughs> no, but I think that's actually. Well, you win some, you lose some. Well, no, and I think that's a, that's a good thing for actors to know is that you're going to submit for 100 jobs and you might get one or you might get zero or maybe you'll get 12 of them. I mean, it's you just have to keep doing it. Well, it's interesting that you say that you live out in the outback, but yet you still have lots of auditions and lots of opportunities come your way. And I think there is such a uh, misconception, I think, of you have to live in Sydney or you have to live in Melbourne to be anything and then amount to anything when it comes to acting. So I'd love your take on that. Like, what do you think? Uh, well, I worked closely with the Film Commission in Fiji. So again, my eyes have been opened a little bit to some things. Um, so I'm a regional Queensland actor. Mm. Um, I believe Gold Coast and Sunshine Coast also yeah, qualify regional. as regional. And so on funding applications. We get brownie points. Yeah. There are, there are boxes to tick. Yeah, that's um, right. So that you have to, like if you hire someone from the regions, then for funding that, um, especially if you're getting state funding or federal funding, you can go, okay, great. I have people from this underrepresented um, mm. group of actors who are regional actors. So that's sort of like the little secret about yeah. living out so of So move city. out of Sydney and Melbourne. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe. I don't Ooh, know. Controversy. We love a bit of that. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, my friend Beck Bignall, who lives in WA, um, does a po- well, she does a podcast for Regional Australia Institute called You Move Where, and I was on it. And then, uh, do you know who Pippa Grandison is? She was in Muriel's Wedding. Oh, yes. Um, and if you've seen Muriel's Wedding, she's the dark-haired girl. Um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> uh, she's, anyway, she's like an iconic Australian actor. And she doesn't live, she lives in, in the regions now. She lives in WA. Mm-hmm. Marta Dusseldorp now lives down um, from, um, Marta, from Janet King and a bunch of other shows. She lives in Tasmania now. So... Yeah, I mean, Chris, again, these Chris are like... Chris Hemsworth lives in Byron. Yeah, and I mean, again, now we're talking about like, you know, recognizable names. And yeah. so you can have a little bit more freedom, I yeah, guess. Yeah, you can sort of be called anywhere, I guess. But yeah. when you're starting out, maybe, do you think be, being in the bigger markets is as important? I mean, now in self-tape days, being online. I think like your quality of life and your mental health are the most important. Yeah, And so 100%. you find your support networks... Um, yeah, I mean, and you, of course, the cities are where things are being made. Yeah. I have a few Brisbane friends who moved down to Sydney in the past year or two years, and I thought both of them were really going to smash it in Sydney. Uh, they sort of felt like they were being limited. Um, they're both from um, multicultural backgrounds, and they felt that they were being a bit limited um, in Queensland. And I was like, ah, oh, in Sydney, you're going to fall into this show and this show and this show and this show. And I spoke to one of them the other day and he said, oh, no, he said, mm. it's so much quieter. He said, I had the networks yeah, that's in Brisbane. Right. He's like, I was known because it was a smaller market. He said, yeah. so I think I might move back. <laughs> I said, okay, well, you know, fair enough. Yeah, so that's it's a right. Bit it takes of, a long time to build the networks. I it mean, does. when you move cities, all of a sudden you're you're starting from scratch again. And yeah. I think the film industry in each city is quite a bit of a bubble sometimes. Yeah. And so if you're part of the bubble, then it's actually only like it's wiser to be that big fish in a small pond rather than becoming a really tiny fish in a huge pond. Yeah. And also being clever about your visibility and that's both face-to-face visibility and online visibility. So like Anthony Mindel, who's one of the acting coaches that I really admire and have worked with in LA, he says to everybody, he says, you're going to move to LA and don't expect to even get a single, like one line part for five years. Wow. He said, and then maybe by 10 years, they might start looking at you for guest stars or, you know, or possibly for something bigger. Um, and Man, he that's said, going to crush some dreams. Well, right, I know. <laughs> and he's, he's like, it has nothing to do with your skill and ability. It's just it has to do with the networking. And that L.A. is huge. Like, people come from all over America and all over the world to try to make it big in Hollywood. So you can even imagine, you know, like, you, mm. you think that, 
uh, uh, you know, we think Sydney's a bigger community than Brisbane or whatever, but then you go yeah. like to Hollywood. It's like they're on steroids. Yeah, it's like, wow. Um, well, how, yeah. how have you personally been navigating sort of wanting to make it as an actor, working career, you know, there had, obviously it's a very challenging path. So how are you sort of dealing with that and creating opportunities for yourself to there, get there? There are a lot of myths um, that are perpetuated in our, in our industry. Um, when I was in my 20s and 30s, the big myth that was going around was that if you wanted to be an actor, you had to only be an actor. Mm. Um, you, couldn't, you couldn't help people out as a stage manager or, or do some assistant directing or, um, you know, run the light board or whatever, because then everyone will be like, oh, well, they don't really want to be an actor. Yeah, you know, like oh, they're, they're distracted. They're going to do something else, yeah. right? And that was so, that's, it's, that was a myth that got busted. I mean, honestly, I was being asked to direct things a lot or even working in casting. I thought, I don't want to work in casting. And I still like look at crew jobs here in Australia and kind of go, oh, well, I don't want to mm. put myself into that crew job because then that's going to exclude me from a possible opportunity to be asked to audition for a role. Yeah. But then you get on set, like for a drift with Shailene Woodley, um, who coincidentally trained with Anthony Mindel in LA. Um, I had been in contact with the casting director from the very beginning. I went for this very small role um, sort of at the end of the film. Um, like, on my like day one of casting in Fiji, mm. they really liked me. They passed me on to the director. The casting director came back and she said, well, we're going to hold on to that. Cause that's going to be like day 68 or whatever. Um, can you do some utility stand-ins for us? So I went and stood in for some of the actors, like, you know, not the leads, but just some of the secondary actors. Um, I think I did a little bit of art department on the movie as well, just because they needed someone for the day. Nice. Um, and then it got to the bit and they were like, well, you know, what? it's actually going to be better because we're on day 68 and we're at the end of the budget. We're actually just going to use the, the second AD. Um, oh, that, that happens a lot. Yeah. Like for this one line speaking role, do you want to come on as an extra that day? And I was like, sure, I'll come on as an extra. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like that, that, so, so like this idea that I can't do a different job mm. because it's going to exclude limiting. me from being an actor uh, well, guess what? Maybe if I do that job in the art department, then they'll be like, hey, you're here today. We need someone because so-and-so had a car accident or has COVID or whatever. Can You're an actor, aren't you? Yes. Great. Can you step in front yep. of the camera and say this line? Thank you. Yeah. Credit. You know, you get paid. And and you know what? The same thing happened to me. Yeah. I was I, I, I signed up on a feature film. I can't name it yet, but I signed up as a crew member and I was just in the unit department. I was pretty much like glorified coffee girl and I was helping pack down, pack up. It was tough, but there was a day when they needed an actor to have a couple lines with the lead. And they were like, oh, Deb, you're an actor, right? Can you do it? And I was like, yep. And then they gave me the script. I learned the lines like pretty much right then and there and then delivered it. Director was happy and I'm pretty sure that in the future I'll have another opportunity to act with him because he's making, you know, two or three feature films a year. So it's all, it's all like playing the game. You have to be strategic and it's a bit, it's a bit like playing chess. I feel like this acting little game, you know, yeah. you have to, you have to play your cards, right? Well, you have to place the, the, the pieces, right? And then it's all really just expanding the network. Yeah, and it's 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 writing those goals, you know, it's writing your your one year goals, your five year goals, your ten year goals, and then being able to be flexible with that. Yeah. Um, Betty Buckley, who's a great uh, Broadway stage actor and a great film and television actor, um, when I was a student at NYU at New York University, she gave a lecture and she said basically, you can't determine where your career is going to go. You just have to be open to follow your career where it's going to take you. And I thought that was great advice. I think that is great advice. And then I think because I'm a hustler, I like to put more balls in my court. And it's like, okay, well, if you can, you can do that. And then you can be open to opportunities, but also just create your own. I think this channel has really sort of, I guess, like repeated that over and over again. It's like, if you're able to funnel some money into putting a team together to make your own films, then cast yourself as the star and you can get pretty far with that. I, you know, I mean... Vin Diesel's career started like that. 
Well, I mean, a lot of people do. Charmaine, Charmaine Bigwa, who um, won the Heath Ledger Scholarship and was on, um, was it The Good Wife that she was just on with Christine She was with Bransky? Will Smith? Yeah, yeah. The and big Will Smith, one? Yeah. yeah, yeah. She made her own thing because she was sitting around Sydney going, well, nobody else is casting me, so I guess <laughs> I'll make my thing. And she spoke about her, her true identity is as a black queer person and, um, and didn't make any apologies for it. And that was sort of the thing that um, sort of, I think boosted her yeah. at least within the Australian industry. And I think that that's really important as well is to um, not try to please everybody, mm. but to be true to yourself. Um, for example, when I look at your website, you know, I've learned some things about you that are really interesting, you know, that you're Belgian, yeah. um, that you speak with an American accent because you went to an American school that you speak three or four languages yeah. fluently. Plus you've done stunt work. So you sort of laid it out really easily for people, someone who like myself perhaps who's a casting director who doesn't know and I go oh you know there, there's these bullet points these are all things that I didn't know yeah. I'm half Polish oh. um so that comes up I I advertise that I guess is, is, <laughs> or I or at least I bring it up in conversation because it's a I'm from a second generation Polish American immigrant family and that ex, that life experience of being Polish and being like a new American yeah. um, influences everything that I do uh, because I, that's my lived experience. That's my, I see things through that's that it. sort of um, perspective. And also as an LGBTQIA plus person, I see things through that. So we're all, rather than try to give the director what they want or the casting director what they want, I go, well, what if this character were me? Yeah. <laughs> and this is, uh, Jennifer that's- Lawrence says it as well. Jennifer Lawrence, when she did her first movie, they were like, well, so how do you act? And she said, well, I stand there and I listen to what the person said to me. And then I respond as if I were the character and it's how I would respond. Well, sometimes (laughs) what makes you unique and special is actually what they want. Like it's the missing puzzle piece, that special sauce in that character that they were looking for in the first place. And And I think... Actually, the more I direct short films and now that I'm moving closer to directing a feature film, when I'm casting for someone, it's like it's I mean, it's very much like first impression what you see. But then it's actually like, oh, what is the the sort of vibe I'm getting from that person? Because if it comes naturally and that's the character, that's going to be way better than someone trying to be something else. Yeah. So I guess we all have our little flares and, and the things that make us special and your background and your travels and your experiences, I think always help with that. Yeah. And it's a, it's a, it, we're looking what we're looking for in casting is point of view. Mm. We're looking for an actor's point of view and it takes, it's, it takes a lot of, you know, self reflection and self, you know, to, to see what's safe to, sh- the, what, what part of your point of view is safe to share. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, because I could tell you, I watched whiplash the other day that, um, that film with J.K. Simmons is this really, really mean guy. Yeah. And I don't think J.K. is mean in real life, but clearly there was something that he was, I, if you haven't seen it. He's, yeah, I feel he's, like he has like he personal screams frustrations. screams and yells maybe. throughout the whole thing. <laughs> and you're like, well, he clearly, there was something, something of his lived experience and of his history. Yeah. Was, he was able to draw on and bring that to this character. 100%. Now that you have all this great experience and you have wisdom on your side, Imagine a young actor who's dreaming about making it in Hollywood and you can reverse the clock, I guess. What would you tell that person? Um, Start where you want to finish is what I usually tell people. So, yeah, like if you want to be a Hollywood actor, um, find your way to Hollywood. (laughs) And then (laughs) especially if you're young uh, there, even if you don't go like you don't move over there. There's all these sorts of like summer programs or like six week programs or something that you can do. So if you, you know, if you're in the financial situation or if there's a scholarship that you can, um, that you can get to that, mm. um, look at, I mean, Screen Queensland has a wealth of resources for people that want to be involved in the screen industry here. Um, so look at their website, look at their socials and try to get involved in that. And the other thing is you don't just apply once. So say you want to go for the Heath Ledger scholarship. If you don't know what that is, I think it still exists. Mm. Um, they send an actor like to Hollywood for a certain amount of time. They get some meetings and some training. I'm not exactly sure because I've never done it. But you don't apply for it once and then go, oh, I didn't get it. So mm. I'm never going to apply for it again. You keep applying for it. Right? Because yeah. if you don't keep applying for it or if, or if Screen Queensland, you know, has, you want to be a director and they have a director's attachment and you apply for one and then you don't apply for the next one. If 
and then you don't apply for the next the, the next one. Then the somebody else, you know, Joe mm-hmm. applied for the first one, the second one, and the third one. So by the third one, they said, "Oh, yeah. you know, Joe's here. Joe is invested in this. I'm going to move Joe up the list." So it's always it's like standing in a queue. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're always trying to advance in the queue. That's it. And then sometimes you have to step out of the queue, and that's fine. And that there's personal reasons, family, whatever. Then you have to step back into the queue. But hopefully, I'll have some friends further up in the queue who will say, hey, just jump up a few spaces and stand here with yeah, me. Yeah, that's right. You know? Oh, my yeah. gosh. I love so, that. So it is, yeah, it is a bit of start where you want to finish. I think that I like that. Yeah. Matt, what have you got coming up or what have you, what have you been working on? Okay. Well, um, I think I've mentioned a few of them already. So I was um, Fiji unit crew on The Castaways, which is on Paramount Plus in the U.K., our international listeners. Um, hopefully that will come to a streaming service here. Uh, I'm in an independent feature called Heart of the Man as an actor. Ooh, with Dave Cook. With David Cook. And um, also I um, I teach online as an acting coach through Takuna Acting Club. Mm-hmm. So please reach out to me if you want to work on US accent, audition prep. I can look at your show reel or your headshot and give you advice. Um, oftentimes it's like being a therapist. I'm just, you know, they <laughs> just give you the strength. To, it's like, really? I, I can do that. Yes, you can do that. Um, yeah. So please look at me there. And through Takuna, um, I am out in Blackall in our population of 1600 people out wow. there. <laughs> We're doing a town musical this year. So I'm running, oh. I'm running a, a musical theater workshop, um, out there and we're going to start casting a town musical so that's beautiful a little bit of everything some some things which pay a lot of money some things which pay nothing and some things which but hopefully things that benefit community the whole time i love it matt thank you so much for joining the podcast thank you deborah it's been wonderful thank you thank you for listening and we'll catch you in the next one